Today on the show, the pleasure of speaking with James Nielsen. James is the principal and head of Avis, Avison, uh, Young's Tri-State Investment Group Sales Group, where he leads a group of three dozen professionals in the sale of multifamily office development and retail properties. In 2018, this Tri-State Investment Sales Group closed on over 16 sales valued at over $394 million, resulting in Avison Young naming James as one of its top sales professionals for the year. To top it all off, James is also the host of the real estate show called Real Estate investing live from New York. So he's a, a huge wealth of knowledge. I'm really excited and pumped to have him on the show today, but enough of me. Let's get him out of here. G'day, James. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today, mate? Good day, Reed. Great <laughs> to see you. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm a big fan of your show and your book and everything that you're doing for investors out there. And I was really thrilled to have you on my show. So for, for all of you listening to this, if you've not heard, uh, Read story recently. It's an incredible one. So please check it out on, on my show. Well, mate, I, I'm, I'm blushing here. So thank you very much for the, for the shout out. But uh, today's show is going to be a little bit more about you. We're going to reverse the, the roles and we're going to get into your story. And, um, but before we do get into your story, rewind the clock and uh, tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid. So I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, in, in the Midwest and uh, got God's country up there. And uh, I, I've got to say, I always liked sales and it was always trying to figure out a, a way to make a buck. And I remember one of my uh, early projects was we had these community gardens and, you know, my, my mom, she'd have all the vegetables and everything planted. But um, I, I decided that I would just fill up the whole thing with, with flowers, uh, zinnias, I, I remember. And I would go and I would bundle them and then I would sell them. On, on the street. And so, uh, because I didn't have to, to pay for the community garden or, or I think even the seeds, the, uh, the, the ROI was, was uh, you know, through the roof back then. <laughs> but just, um, you know, that always stuck with me. Um, my grandfather was actually in the car dealership business. So even, um, you know, in my college days in the summer, I, I even uh, tried a hand one summer of selling used cars where you know, if you, if you can do that, you can do pretty much anything. So uh, th th those were just a, a couple of things that I did along the way. How was the used car sales business going? Or how was it, how, how was it as a, as, uh, it as was, a sort of entry you know, It was really tough. I, I have a lot of respect for these people because, you know, when you, you step onto a car lot, you, you assume that you're going to get ripped off right from the start. Right. Yes. And, um, you know, so, so, and the other thing is car sales people are so pushy you always think that you know, they're trying to get you to do something that day. And the reason is, is if you don't, you're probably going to go shop at another dealership. So, uh, but, but I, I definitely had some stories, uh, for, you know, from those days uh, where uh, we had one disgruntled buyer and, and before he made an offer, he had to put his deposit down and it was a busy day on the lot and hours went by. I couldn't get my sales manager to negotiate. And um, you know, he, he was, he was getting pretty you know steamed and finally he said, you know, give me my money back. And, uh, you know, I, I, I definitely, uh, gave in, but, uh, it, it, it was a little rough and tumble, but again, if you, if you can, if you can do that, you can, you can get through anything. Exactly. No, it, it's super important having that background in sales to, to help you go out there and know the value of a dollar and then know the value of a product in order how to, to then pitch it correctly to someone to then want to exchange money for that particular product. And I'm sure over your career, your pitch is probably your pitching in general, I should say has probably, been refined uh, many, many times. Would that be correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, in, in sales and, you know, whatever it is, I, I think what I've learned over the years is you're really providing a service and, and you, you need to put yourself in your client's shoes and do what's best for the investor. So whether they're buying a car or in New York, it could be a multi-million dollar asset. You want to tell everyone the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, and really be a, a, you know, an, an advocate for them. So I, I've really, really enjoyed it over, over the years. Um, it's, it's a fascinating business and um, I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, well, we'll go back to your story. So you, you were car salesman earlier on in your career. How did you get into the world of real estate investing or, and being a broker and, and a sales guy um, for Avis and Young? Well, it was really luck. I, I went to uh, Colgate University in upstate New York. Uh, and I, I went there because I swam in college and uh, did, did a little bit of studying too. I, I should, <laughs> should add that. And my senior year, every, every one of my fraternity, they all had jobs, many at the investment banks. I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. I thought maybe I'd head out to the West Coast and make movies or something until I learned that you actually needed, uh, no one was actually paying any salary to do that. So I said, I, I better go try to find a quote unquote real job. So I went up to the Career Service Center and this was late in the spring. and 
I, uh, there was a resume drop due that day for a small regional brokerage firm uh, in, in New York City, Massey Knackle. One of the founders, Paul Massey, had gone to Colgate. So uh, they didn't even require a cover letter. They said, just drop your resume, which I did. Later, I found out there was only two people who applied for the job, and I was their second choice. So um, I like to remind them that the other uh, candidate uh, who, who accepted the job and then they ended up taking both of us. He flamed out after six months and I was there, you know, 20 years later. So that, wow. that was at Massey Knackle. And, um, you know, to give Bob and Paul credit who started that firm, uh, they found a niche with, which was middle market building sales. And they said, we're going to carve up the city into territories and we're going to represent sellers exclusively to get them the highest price. And no one else was doing this. The brokers were mostly out there chasing the skyscrapers. No one wanted to deal with the, you know, the million, two million, $10 million deals at the time, where actually 95% of the deal volume took place. Mm. And so, um, but this territory's uh, specialization was really, really key because what we found is if you studied a neighborhood, even for three to six months, learn everything about the neighborhood, comparable sales, what are the new developments, what's going on with leasing values, zoning changes. You could, even being brand new to the business, you could know more than the generalists out there who, who had been doing this for 20, 30 years. So we were very, very successful. Um, They're very kind to me. They ended up promoting me as a partner early on. Um, and I was with them for 17 years. And by the time we sold the company to Cushman and Wakefield, which was about five years ago, we were selling four times the amount of properties as the next brokerage firm in New wow. York City. So we were doing 400 sales a year. Now, our average deal size was, you know, it had certainly risen since, um, you know, the, the days when I started, but, but it was still kind of an average five to $10 million sale. Uh, but we were very comfortable in, in the space and it was a, a great introduction to the business. You mentioned some really key points there, I think, which is, is super, super helpful for, for a lot of people is, is studying neighborhoods because they're studying markets, but then they're studying neighborhoods. And I've always said on this show, like I remember back in two, you know, 2012 when I first moved to the United States and um, the USA has got 400 MSAs, right? When they say the US housing crisis back in 2008, it's like, it's not a blanket statement across everywhere because there's 400 different MSAs and within each MSA, there's a different neighborhood. Within each neighborhood, there's a north, south, east, west, there's a good side of, bad tra- good side of the tracks, the bad side of the tracks. And so getting very niche and, and granular on, on zoning changes um, all the way down to, you know, staying in a neighborhood and understanding what, what things are coming and trying to be at the coalface of those changes and, and talking to local cities and municipalities about the changes will put you in a better point for understanding the true value of a particular asset if you know what's being built two blocks down the way, right? So I think that in itself is a super powerful tool. And you you made a good point about you don't need to know, you might not have any experience, but if you know enough about a certain neighborhood, you can be dangerous and know what the value, the true value of an asset may be worth. So um, so I think that's, I think it's very, very, just straight off the bat, it's extremely valuable advice just there. So Talk to me about like what neighborhoods were you were you focused on? Because I've lived in New York City for two two and a half years. I love that town. Whereabouts were was your sort of territory back in the day? So I started out in, in Chelsea, uh, which was you know if you look at the map of Manhattan, pretty pretty much in the, in the middle, uh, West Twenties, uh, the teens, mm-hmm. and I learned very early the power of zoning because when I started there, you looked up and down Sixth Avenue, and it was nothing but flea markets because then the whole, most of the area was manufacturing. And yep. so, I mean, yes, there was some residential, but going you know, further west towards the river, west of 10th Avenue, was all these uh, abandoned industrial buildings, which ended up becoming the art gallery district and became one of the hottest neighborhoods in the city. But uh, the city came in and they said, look, this is right in the middle of the city. There's plenty of um, transportation we're going to change the zoning from a low rise manufacturing to very high density for residential. And so Mm. almost overnight, you had 30 story buildings popping up and down sixth and seventh Avenue. And I I think for the investors, uh, the small time investors who could either buy up smaller pieces near those developments or on the side streets did incredibly well. And even looking further West uh, and, and kind of, 
being a pioneer and kind of really seeing where the, the opportunities and trends were, you know, once those galleries started to fill up, then the restaurants came, then the, you know, the rest of the retail, uh, they ended up taking this abandoned uh, rail line and turning it into the High Line, which right. now gives five, six million people that, you know, connects Hudson Yards down to the meatpacking district. So if you bought any of those properties and you got in early, th those properties include uh, increased 20 times in value. Yeah. Uh, in, in a matter of years. When, when was this period of time specifically? It was 1998. That's yep. when I got into the business and really 2000, early 2000s was when it, it started to, to really peak. You know, and we talk about New York City as being an island and low cap rates, high demand, low supply, you know, the val the true value of a piece of dirt. And really where I come from in Australia, that like New York City is very similar to the housing that we see in Australia where cash flow is very low because the demand is very high and there's low supply. So the value is all in the land. Um, pivoting just a little bit, I, I, my, I had a bit of an experience working with a structural engineer when I first moved to New York City in 2012 because a lot of the same... I want to, I don't want to say zoning, but the same sort of principles were being applied in Brooklyn, um, actually down in DeKalb Avenue. And a lot of people were buying these single story retail fronts, keeping the facade and then stepping in the columns and then going up like 15, 20 stories. But they kept that facade on the bottom level because from a, a planning point of view, it could be more deemed as a renovation, even though you're only keeping one story than an actual new build. So I was involved in a couple of, in 2012, a lot of the development in and around downtown Brooklyn um, and expanding in and around that sort of uh, near the Barclays Center as well, um, where, where it was just being built back in the day. But interesting type of stuff when you talk about the power of zoning. And if you don't understand it, we'll go and understand it. So, so what, what advice do you have for those people out there thinking that they want to get, they want to know zoning more? Where, where should they go and what are some good resources? And I guess every single municipality is different, but for your specific area and, and, and niche in New York, what, what's a good place to, to jump online and, and check it out? Yeah, so uh, New York City does have very technical zoning. There's all different, not only defining the use, but uh, you know what type of bulk, height, setbacks, uh, it is very, very complicated. The zoning handbook is over a thousand pages. You can go to the New York City's uh, city planning website and you can download it all if, if you're having trouble sleeping at night. But uh, <laughs> yes, I, I work closely with zoning council, uh, architecture firms, and, and I know and I've listened to your show before and kind of the advice to have your team ready to be able to move on things. And so you want to have the right professionals because you know, not all investors have the same information. And if right. you can find something that no one else sees, I have a very good client and, I, and I, I, I joke with her because I once sold her this property in the in the West Village and I thought I got a great price. And then I saw that she got plans approved to build another structure behind the property. I said, how did you even do that? She's, well, there's some nuance in the zoning code where <laughs> the way the buildings are separated, I could build another structure. So wow. uh, she, she got a two for one sale there, but, um, you know, the nice thing about New York City is it is as of right. So as technical as the zoning is, you know what you can and can't do. Right. In other municipalities, you might not know. I mean, I, I've heard horror stories in some of these towns in Westchester where investors, developers have been waiting for years for approval. So really, um, advice to your listeners, if you're going into an area where, you know, you have to go through uh, an extensive review process. You've got to make sure that you have staying power. Maybe it's a covered land play where you've got some income on the site where you wait, you know, and then the other end of the spectrum is you've got markets like Houston, where if I'm not mistaken, you can build anything you want. Right. right. So, um, you know, which might sound great and it, it certainly allows for a lot of development, but then as an investor, you have to think, okay, well, if I own this property here, and across the street, nothing's stopping anyone from building another 50-story tower or another gated community, does my investment then become obsolete? Right. So um, I think that's, that's definitely something to consider. I think uh, it's also looking at the highest and best use of, of a particular piece of dirt. And, and, and particularly in coastal markets like LA, San Francisco, New York, being savvy like that, that particular client that you're working with and seeing 
the diamond and not necessarily it's even the diamond in the rough. You could have a really nice freaking building, but if you've got extra additional land in the back and you know how to look for loopholes in, in and around the zoning code, that is a huge value add that you can bring to a team in terms of, and even to your investment thesis, right? Like you completely are now viewing this piece of dirt or this building with so much more value. And, you, and to your point, you thought you made a crack and sale on it. And you thought you got the highest and best use for it. But she came back and said, actually, screw you, James, mate. I've actually got, I, 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 I got a two for one here. So um, no, it's, it, look, development's uh, very near and dear to my heart. I, I've worked for many developers in the past before going out and doing my own stuff. So, but I want to get back to you and your story because this is about you. Um, in and around being a broker, what type of advice can you give to people out there who are trying to, build a good relationship with brokers. I know, you know, up until this is, this is we're recording this midst of the COVID-19 locked in our houses and it was very frothy, the, the market coming up until pre-COVID. Um, what, do you, what, what, what advice do you give to people to try and stand out and get, get the attention of brokers in, in, in terms of the, getting the right deal flow uh, for, for investors and buyers when, when they're trying to hunt, hunt for deals? So, um I, I know your show, you, you have a lot of aspiring investors. Um, I, I certainly have a, a, a similar audience on my show as well as the, the veterans. And, you know, the same advice applies for everyone. You know, be a straight shooter, you know, and, and I know your, your integrity is, is paramount as is mine in the business. And if you're new to the game, it's okay to say that I'm new to the game. Don't, don't try to come in and, and try to pretend that you can do something that you can't because mm. as big of a market is that New York City is, you know, we all do take notes. We all, you know, see how you perform on a transaction. So if something's a little bit over your head, maybe bring in a partner, bring in a co-GP partner if it's going to be too heavy a lift. Bring in someone with credibility because for us, um, you know, as this, when I'm representing the seller, yes, I have a job to do to go out and market the property and get the highest and best price, but I also have a job to make sure that I'm dealing with a credible buyer. Right. And so, you know, usually we're looking for track record. We're going to ask you, what else have you bought in the past? You know, sometimes we're going to ask you for proof of funds, but we're going to be looking to qualify you. Um, so again, if you do not have that experience, you know, my advice is go partner with someone first, get that experience under your belt. And, you know, after you have a couple of deals on your resume, it's going to be a, a lot easier. No, hundred percent. And, and to that point, how do you then go and try and maximize the value for a particular, you know, your clients these days? Um, and, and do you have a sort of a, a methodology to go and maximize uh, building prices sure. when you come to sale? Yeah, it, it, it's something that I'm, I'm passionate about. And, and I think it's also um, important to know there's definitely two different ways to approach this business or maybe even three ways, but you, you've got, uh, you know, sell side in the transaction where I represent the owner my job is to get the highest price for the seller. In the process, I bring buyers to the table as well. My job is to consummate a transaction, give those buyers the right advice, the right information uh, to guide them to a successful transaction. In the process, I also work with co-brokers out there, other brokers who represent buyers, willing to work with them, split fees. Um, so I think it's important when for your investors, for your listeners, when they're approaching a deal, you want to know, okay, do you have the exclusive listening? You know, who are you representing? Off market sounds really exciting, especially for an investor because they say, well, if it's off market, no one knows about it. But then, you know, what information is that broker even providing you? Do they even, you know, ha have a, a real handle on the situation? Um, but when, um, when I'm representing the, the seller, my job is to maximize the exposure. That means, and in this day and age, and I've been doing this over 20 years, the leaps that we've had in technology over the last couple of years, it, it is so powerful what we can do now. And so, you know, sure, when we send out listings, we do the, the, um, the e-blasts where we're sending them out to the investors. Uh, of course, we're posting them on all the multiple listing sites, whether that's CoStar, LoopNet, Crexy, uh, IDX in New York City. Um, sometimes we partner with 10X and we'll, we'll list our properties online, but we want to get the most exposure possible for our listings. Um, I've found over the last you know, couple of years, social media is incredibly powerful. I'm putting property videos on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, sending the links out on, on Twitter, uh, Instagram. Uh, you know, the the e-blasts are actually becoming less effective because and i'm sure you as an investor you probably get thousands of these you know you just you know you just delete them and so 
I think sometimes maybe, maybe you're on Instagram, you're checking out what, what your mates are doing, uh, you know, on, on vacation or, or at home now uh, while, while we're on lockdown. But, you know, you see a nice looking asset, it, it might be a way to, to get interest. So we really want to make the net cast as wide as possible, bring in the interest. And if I'm really doing my job for a seller, even in a market like today, which is very, very challenging, I'm not going to just say, here, take the first offer you get. My job is to bring in multiple options and sometimes advising the seller that, look, you know, the highest price not, might not be the best offer. Mm. You know, this is a, a better qualified buyer, especially today where there's going to be challenges getting, you know, the type of leverage that maybe uh, investors could have obtained uh, a month or two ago. Uh, someone who has the equity financially qualified, you know, is, is typically who we're going to be recommending as the yeah. front runner. It's, it's interesting. I'm just going to quickly rewind to the off-market piece you said before. And um, we've, we've bought a couple of deals off-market uh, in our portfolio, my business partner and I. But there's actually another school of thought that, because everyone thinks, oh, off-market, great. But there's another school of thought that I think is really interesting. And, and off-market really means pre-listing. It's in your pocket, but you haven't hit the, the, the send to, to the masses yet. And the, 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 thought, the thought process is, well, if I'm getting it off-market, I don't know what the market's going to pay for it. You know what I mean? And so particularly in a frothy market, if you're getting an off-market deal when it's really a buyer's market, a uh, seller's market, you may be overpaying. And so the off-market lead might not be as juicy as what you think it is in your mind. So any comments to that? Because I think yeah, it was agree. That's, a, that's a great point. And it's <laughs> something that I say, you know, when the market is going up, you're absolutely right. You want to get in early. You want to preempt. And even when I'm the, you know, the listing agent, I send it out. I tell buyers, look, you, you want to preempt. Just put it in an offer, right? I mean, we'll typically, if we're dealing with a non-real estate professional, they'll probably want to see the process play out. But right. a sophisticated investor, uh, you know, they know where, where the number is to hit the bid. Uh, but, but you're right. When the market is flat or declining, my job as the broker is also to educate my clients. And I, I'm, I've been working on a portfolio on the Upper East Side where we started at $100 million. Then we had massive rent reform that took place in New York City. And now this, I mean, pricing on that is probably going to come down by 30%. Wow. But, but if, if, if we didn't bring that to market and educate our clients, we would not have gotten to that point. So, uh, yes, our job is, is to, to really educate the sellers on the market. And sometimes, uh, as the investor, you want to have the, uh, be the last phone call. So, you know, stay close to the broker. You, you were asking earlier about advice. Um, look, I, I do the, the most important thing that I do when I market properties, I'm doing direct outreach. Right. And I'm calling investors and I'm saying, look, I have an opportunity because I know how ineffective emails are now. But <laughs> delete, if I really delete. know, <laughs> yeah, Reed, if I really know what you're looking for and I can call you with something that's really tailored to your criteria. And yes, I've got a Salesforce database that helps me know who to call what on. You're going to pick up the phone. And instead of trying to pitch you three or four dozen exclusives that I'm working on, I'll say these are the best two or three that I think you should focus on. And this is why. And I think the investors really. Uh, appreciate that. But the flip side is I've found that some of the best investors, they're calling me, they're pushing me. I've got uh, some buyers who ask to come into my office once a month and they say, look, James, I want to go through the stack. Don't rule anything out. And you know, you'd be surprised. Sometimes they'll say, well, you know, there's this one where, you know, I, I'm not quite sure what the story is. They say, no, 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 I'll take that one. I'll buy it. So <laughs> you want to, you want to, you want to stay close to your brokers, reach out to them, uh, you want to work with a lot of brokers and there's no one broker in a city that has all the listings. Uh, you you want to reach out and, and have a network. I want to quickly pivot a little bit into, we speak a lot on this show about, you know, cash flow and, and more affordable markets and, you know, more moderate cap rates. You're in the belly of the beast in terms of low cap rate environments. Um, and it has been for decades. What do investors look for in New York City from a long-term point of view? Are they more focused on the long-term and not too much worried about the cash flow? Or what are you seeing? How do, how does, how do investors make a dollar in, in New York City? Well, we used to say you, you, make, the mar you, you make your profit on the sell, not, not the, the buy. And so what, what happens is that um, in, in New York where rents have risen so dramatically, okay, most of our investors are value add as opposed to core core plus where they're just taking you know 
clipping coupons. They're looking for a situation, long-term ownership, building's been mismanaged, rents are below market. They're looking to improve upon the property. And, um, you know, yes, for, for a while, New York City certainly benefited by a kind of a three, four cap type market. Well, guess what? That's changing now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going to change everywhere. But um, one thing that did happen in our multifamily segment is now we have uh, rent reform. Now, we've always had rent stabilization and even rent control dating uh, before World, World War II. But uh, what they said in New York, and there's 3 million housing units there, they said, look, we're going to take these million rent stabilized units and you are no longer going to be able to decontrol them and charge a market rent. So the way it used to work is these investors would buy these stabilized buildings where they find tenants who are paying a thousand a month for a two bedroom that should be worth, you know, 4,000. Right. And they would either go in there and they'd find out which tenants were illegally occupying those apartments or they'd buy them out. And then they would go in and triple and quadruple the rent. And so, you know, there were massive fortunes made. So that, that was really the process Buy the building, increase the rent roll, go and sell it in five years or refi out. Today, that's a lot more challenging because they don't allow you to do that with the existing rent regulated. You can do that with fair market units, although they're now talking about um, what you're seeing out in California. We're having basically universal rent control limits on how much you can raise your fair market rent. So for all of your listeners, so important to understand the markets where you're investing you know, is there rent regulation? Are there restrictions on increases? What type of affordability components are there? Um, but I'm still seeing uh, there was tremendous potential still in the office market here in New York. I mean, last year we had record leasing. There was over 45 million square feet leased in New York City. We had Facebook that just took a million and a half square feet. After we sent Amazon packing, which, which I think was the worst failure of local government ever, they're still back and they just bought the Lord and Taylor building from uh, WeWork of, uh, you know, of all people uh, that actually happened right before this uh, pandemic started. Uh, so they're there and we have the talent. And that is really for your listeners. I think the most important driver is job growth. You have to look where are the cities that are growing and, you know, look at job growth. The jobs are there. The apartments follow the retail follows. And, you know, th th this next cycle here is going to be very telling because there there's a lot of questions out there where do people start to work more from home? Right. Are they going to want to live in cities? Are they going to want to live in the suburbs? So um, I, I certainly don't have a crystal ball on that. I mean, I I've got some thoughts. I mean, I think the workplace of the future certainly will change. And I think some people will work from home. But I also think that the reason why Facebook and even Google's the you know the biggest example they they have I think they have um, close to uh, I mean several million square feet now in New York City and they're growing because that's where the talent is people still want to live and work in New York City and that's what makes it so attractive. Right, it's a sec it's a sexy market. Um, you, you, job growth, I completely agree with you. Following the talent, but you also mentioned three to four percent cap rates. Do you think that's going to change even with a low interest rate environment like we are predicting to still be in, even post pandemic? You know, I just delivered our state of the market for the first quarter, and I was because all those sales still were negotiated at the end of last year, yep. so we really haven't seen what's going to happen. Uh, post, uh, you know, COVID and the, the real impact, I believe this year is going to look like 2009, where the only sales that are going to happen are going to be the estate sales, partnership sales, and ultimately the banks and the distress. Okay. So, um, you know, you're going to see very few sales as far as the returns and kind of looking back to what happened 2007, 2009, uh, peak to trough. There was cap rate expansion of uh, almost 100 basis points for multifamily and for office and retail was 150 basis points. So um, our multifamily cap rates had already risen from three and four to five, five and a half percent as a result of this reform. I was at the National Multifamily Housing Conference down in Orlando and our brokers in the southeast, you know, they were handing out, you know, four, four and a half caps down in, you know, Charlotte. And uh, you know, down in Florida and Texas, and they had a, a line around the you know the block. And I'm trying to sell five, five and a half caps in New York City, and they're saying, well, you know, if I don't have upside and I can't raise the rents, why would I do that? 
Right. So uh, if you tack on 100 basis points to that, could New York City actually be uh, over a six cap market for multifamily? Um, I would be shocked just because there is so much money, uh, certain, certainly foreign capital and interest in our market that I think investors are going to look for stability. They're going to look for hard assets. There's so much uncertainty in the stock market that's bouncing up and down. Uh, but we're going to absolutely uh, receive cap rate expansion. And, and you're saying cap rate expansion irregardless of what happens with these interest rates? Well, I, I was going to come to that next, which is, yes, the 10-year treasury remains at all-time lows. But unfortunately, I think what you're going to see happen, I mean, right now, banks have become so conservative. CMBS is out of the market. Uh, life insurance companies are, are, are definitely cautious. Community banks have really been the lenders, but they are pulling back. They're becoming a lot more conservative with their loan to values, but they're also asking for uh, wider spreads uh, for the risk. And so our debt equity group, they were saying, guys, that the days, unfortunately, of 3% money are, are gone. So I, I, they're expecting you know, 100, 150 basis point shifts as well, again, just because of the spread. Uh, so I, I, I think the cap rates will, will track along with that. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And that's very interesting insight on terms of that you're thinking because you've taken away the value add opportunity, thus the cap rate is expanding and, and people view a New York City asset because you can't perceive to add the value and some compared to say somewhere like Texas where you don't have that rent control and you have all this up, quote unquote upside, um, they can jam the cap rate down and they can sell that at a lower cap rate than, than New York City. I would take a New York City asset over a Texas asset any day of the week because uh, I just know the value of, of dirt. So, um, But I want to quickly pivot before we end up round up the show here into your your your, your podcast and, and and the whole why and how to help your business and why did you just sign to go do a podcast um, uh, in New York City? You know, it, it really started as a passion project. I, I love teaching. Uh, I, I've taught as an adjunct at, at NYU and just in my business. I, I really think it's so important to be. Uh, a source for information. I, I really feel that I'm in the information business, not in the sales business. And so I am passionate about it. Um, you know, besides your show uh, and maybe a few others, there's actually very few shows that teach you how to invest in real estate and operate it. I mean, if you look at the stock market, there's hundreds and hundreds of shows on how to play stocks. But you look at real estate, which is when you look at a, Americans, uh, or I would imagine anywhere in the world, uh, individuals' top holdings. I mean, that real estate bucket, including someone's own home, is usually a significant part of their holdings. And yet there's very sh few shows like yours that actually talk about how to do it. And so what I really wanted to do was to showcase investors like yourself, uh, like others uh, in New York who have uh, started with, with you know very little or, or nothing and how they uh, created real estate fortunes. Uh, so I, I've really enjoyed doing it. I learned a ton along the way. So it's, it's, it's really been my pleasure. And, but I'm sure it also has helped your business, right? Your sales business, because I think it's such a key thing that you're saying you're in the information business, you're not in the sales business and coming forth with information and educating people on a particular topic, whether you be a seller, whether you be a buyer, whether you be just someone interested to get dip their toe in the water, having that leading as the first and foremost, rather than asking for something from, you know, a lot of businesses ask for things straight away rather than giving out the information. I think it's super important as to be that key person of influence. So um, I, I'm sure you've seen your business also on, on the sales side grow in leaps and bounds as well. Will that be correct? Yeah, it, it's been a great exposure tool. And, you know, a lot of my competitors, they just call up owners. Are you selling? No, click. Are you selling? No, <laughs> click. You know, and, and I, I really try to take that longer term perspective. And it, it is a great way to uh, help educate people and help show that, that I'm active and have knowledge in this area. So it, it, it's been a great thing to help get the word out on, on what we're doing. I'm, I'm two years in at Avis and Young building out our tri-state investment sale platform. Uh, and and it's, it's really important to stay top of mind and let investors know uh, that we're a resource out there. And I've also encouraged, we have 60 offices across the US. So for any of your listeners who are looking to buy in certain markets, I mean, feel free to lean on us for information. 
and it might just be comps and helping figure out a market. And, and I always believe that you got to take the long view in this business. 100%, 100%. Well, James, uh, you've been a wealth of information. Um, to wrap up the show, we like to dive into a lightning round called the top five investing tips. You ready to get into it? Yes. Mate, what is the daily habit to you practice to keep on track towards your goals? I think it's just consistency and tenacity. Even on lockdown, I'm still getting up early, maybe not at a four handle, but it's 5.30 in the morning. It's being highly scheduled and really prioritizing to make sure that the most important things happen each day. Love it, love it. Um, who's been the most influential person in your career to date? You know, I, I've got to go with a tie there. It's got to be Paul Massey and Bob Knackle, who uh, founded the firm where I started my career. I learned so much, and I would encourage all of your, your listeners out there, have a mentor, have someone that you keep close by. I got better than an MBA by spending time in a yes. cube next to them, and so am uh, eternally grateful. Love that. I got better than the NBA by, by, by being in the weeds and in the, in the trenches. I think that's super important. Um, question number three is, in your business, you would have a most influential tool. And when I say tool, it could be a phone, it could be a, you know, a hardware like a phone, or it could be software. So what is the most influential tool you use on a daily basis in your business? You know what? I, I might answer the question in a slightly different way, sure. which is, uh, and I haven't give, given them enough credit on this, this show yet, but having a team. Mm. I have a group, and you mentioned uh, in the lead up that I have three dozen people in the group. There is no way that I could even do a fraction of what I'm able to accomplish without an incredible team. So having uh, dedicated research analysts, having associates with boots on the ground, so important to have a team. The technology piece to it is having the database that we share it all so we can really leverage that information. But uh, again, this is not a business that you want to try to do on your own. No, I think that's, yeah, it's super important. Teams uh, do make or break the business. And you're, you're actually not the only person who said that, but we've got a few people on the show that have said their team is the most important tool in their business. And it is, it's, it's correct because you can't do everything yourself and in your, you're a madman to think if you, if you can. <laughs> uh, in one sentence, what has been the biggest failure in your career and what do you learn from that failure? I think talking too much. <laughs> Which, uh, <laughs> and I want to qualify that by saying when I started off, I figured that I had to just uh, try to show everyone that I knew everything instead of mm. listen. Mm. So the advice is there's so much knowledge out there, just listen. I'm sorry, that was probably more than a sentence. No, 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 that's good. That. That's good. No, yeah, just sort of shutting up and listening and not, and not thinking that you need to prove something, right? Ego, which is probably what it boils down to at the end of the day. So, um, mate, last question is where can people reach you to continue the conversation? They want to be in your sphere. Where do they go? Perfect. So uh, would love people checked out the podcast, uh, which is Real Estate Investing Live from New York. It's on the Voice America Network. Uh, it's syndicated on iTunes and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. My social media handles are James Nelson NYC. So we put a lot of content up on LinkedIn uh, and, and uh, Twitter as well as Instagram. So please connect with me or email James period Nelson at avisonyoung.com or call me 917-362-1485 is myself. Awesome. Awesome. Well, mate, I want to thank you for taking some time out of the day to jump on this show. I just want to reflect a few of the things that I took away from today's conversation. I think the number one thing or a couple of the top things I took away was the first thing was the power of zoning, understanding the power of zoning. And you can make money in any single market, regardless of how hot and frothy it is. If you know the power of zoning, I think that was, is probably the number one piece of advice that I took away from today's show and that everyone should be writing that down. And if you don't know zoning, you can go out and get some good thousand page uh, books online uh, about it. But looking at zoning changes and really studying a neighborhood. The other thing I, I think is, is you're in the information business and leading that first and foremost uh, as, a, as a sales card, uh, not wanting to sell anything to someone, but actually providing information to people means that you will ultimately be the point of reference or that first of mind when they think of wanting to sell their, biz, uh, their, their, their building or if they want to invest in a deal, they will come to you. So I think that's super important. And the last piece of advice that I really took away from today's show is the talent. Where is talent going? Jobs, 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 and following that talent in terms of the market growth and seeing what other market factors will come from that because of where the talent is. So I think those three pieces of advice have been super informative. Um, did I leave anything out? No, I think uh, 
that's all fantastic. And it's just, you know, continue to improve yourself by listening to shows like these, uh, especially while we're, we're on lockdown, you know, don't sit idle, use this as time to improve yourself. So uh, again, uh, if your listeners, I'd be surprised that they haven't picked up a copy of your book, but uh, if not, they should, uh, should definitely order it online. Mate, thank you very much for the plug. But again, I want to thank you for taking some time out of your day. Enjoy the rest of your week and we'll catch up very, very soon. Awesome. Thanks so much, Reed. Well, there you have another cracking episode jam-packed with some incredible advice from James. Please do check out his website um, and make sure you check out his podcast as well, Real Estate Investing Live from New York. It is a cracking podcast that has all information about investing in New York tri-state area. Um, I think James is a wealth of knowledge and you need to definitely check him out and and check out Avis and Young as well because they are also a wealth of knowledge in terms of if you're looking to buy commercial real estate in maybe your local market or or in a market that you're looking to invest in. I want to thank you all again for taking some time out of your day to tune in to continue to grow your financial IQ because that's what we're all about here on this show. The easiest way to give back to this show is giving us a five-star review on iTunes and we're going to do it all again next week. So be bold, be brave. Remember, go give life a crack.